Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. This is our second Stored IQ user group of 2016. It's going to be a really great event today. We have Mass Mutual on the line with us. So before I hand the mic over to the Mass Mutual team and Scott Burt, we have a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar. Um, user group presentation, you can do it in the question box right here. And I will just hand this right on over to Scott. Excellent. Hey, everybody, can you, uh, Kristen, can you hear me? I assume everybody can. I'll turn on the camera just for a brief moment here for a uh, face to the name. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Stored IQ user group, that's exactly what this is, is a, uh, a user group, peer-to-peer -peer sharing of information and experiences. And uh, our next speaker uh, is hopefully and maybe one of you. So uh, we welcome your submissions for topics that you'd like to share on uh, of your experiences and the like. And, and as well, as part of this being a user group, uh, the user group is we run it off of LinkedIn. And uh, if you just go, go to LinkedIn and search on Stored IQ User Group, you'll find it at the top of your list. And uh, sign up to be a member, and Kristen uh, will uh, accept you into the club. So uh, with that, we're very delighted to have uh, Mass Mutual, uh, two folks uh, coming here to speak with us today, Jen Tincotti and Clark Huber. We want to thank him very much. This is not their normal thing being uh, uh, speaking to a large audience. So we want to thank them. And uh, we're going to turn it over to hear their experience. Here we go. Go ahead. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is Jen Tenkati. Uh, myself and Clark Huber um, were asked to, to work on a case study here of an internal audit within MassMutual that really um, allowed us to look into producing a heat map. Oh, hold on. Kristen, is the, uh, is the, the go-to menu up, or is it hidden from view? We can see your screen. Is that what you're asking, or okay, there should be a little right arrow? There. Yep. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Again, we were um, asked to do an audit internal that really allowed us to look at um, our Outlook public folders as well as other areas. Um, but our audit request was really to produce a heat map of where potential personal information and or medical information may be located within our Outlook public folders farm. Um, so that was the request we were given. As part of the um, approach for that, we purchased the Stored IQ platform, implemented it within our environment. As part of that, we did a harvest and index of our entire public folder farm, including all high-level folders and subfolders. Um, we initially started our harvest at the highest folder level. Um, with that, we then created filters for personal information and medical information, again, so that we could use that to locate potential materials within our OPF structure. After that, we were asked to report on any potential findings of PI or MI, um, as far as counts that we would say as part of our high-low heat map within our secondary folder levels, which was kind of our the second level down from the highest level. Um, and as part of that approach going forward, we engaged Integro as a preferred partner to kind of help us establish this initial approach. Um, and then we have a comment at the bottom that was, you don't know what you don't know, which for Clark and I, um, we really kind of went into this a little, um, what's the word? <laughs> Un uh, kind of unclear. Unclear. Yeah. Exploring the great wild west of what we did not know much of. So. Okay, so uh, not sure how familiar you guys are with Stored IQ, but it is a uh, three-tiered appliance. Uh, there is only one uh, app stack, which is where you're uh, presented with uh, your, your results and where you run your filters from. Uh, there's a single gateway, and then there's as many uh, data stacks as you'd like to uh, implement in your environment that suits your needs. Uh, we actually ended up implementing uh, six uh, data stack servers to connect out to the Exchange public folders as well as some SIFS connections. But, the primary focus that we've used the tool for so far has been the exchange connection for the Outlook public folders. All right. As part, um, as Clark was doing a lot of the hardware and the architecture and the harvesting, um, some of the initiatives that I took on with our support from Integro was doing some information gathering throughout the company to help us kind of understand what our personal information and or medical information could be. Um, so through the interviewing process, we determined that 
the personal information that we'd want to find would include SSNs, TIN, TIN numbers, credit card information, passport type information, driver's licenses, um, and then what we're calling agreements, which really is a number in length of six to, ter uh, six to 30 digits in proximity to any of the following words. So account, account full number or the full name, policy, contract, or loan. Um, so that's what we defined as our personal information. Again, in interviewing some uh, internal folks, we came up with a couple of medical type information that we built out. Again, pertaining to addictive drugs, I will not even try to pronounce any of those. Um, disability type information, so anything where it had like a word physician and or disability and or liberty. Um, and then just some general medical terms that we use as part of our filters. So uh, full texting, um, full text indexing is, is very interesting. Uh, thing to deal with within the uh, Stored IQ uh, tool. It's very, very powerful, uh, but it also comes with it, you know, some, some cautions. Uh, so the first thing is uh, when you're doing full text indexing during a harvest, uh, you have that option. Uh, suggest that you harvest at a lower level uh, with the overall, to reduce the overall size of the full text indexing. Um, another option is to full text index post harvesting. So you'll, you'll harvest, uh, filter down that info set based on metadata values first, such as the file name, age, uh, location, things like that. And then you can execute a full text step up uh, on that remaining info set. Uh, you'll get improved performance with your uh, full text indexing. Um, the accuracy is consistent with either approach that you take. There is no better way to do it. Uh, it really comes down to, you know, when is it best for you based on your, your case? So the decision on when you uh, full text index is, is really what you need to think about, you know. Uh, the reason being is that a, as you filter an info set that has full text indexing, you are not reducing the number of full text index uh, indexes that you're going against. Um, the execution of those full text searches will be against the full complement of the index values that were originally uh, identified. Uh, so try and demonstrate that. Uh, so if you start off with your uh, harvest and your full text index at the time of harvest, you know, you, let's say you hypothetically find a million objects and you're going to have a full text uh, database of, of all the text values that it found within those million objects. Uh, when you filter that down, uh, you might reduce it down to only having 100,000 objects that you're really irrelevant. But when you run a full text search against those 100,000 objects, again, you're still running that, that full text search against the full complement of uh, one million objects. And likewise, you, the more you reduce it, again, you're just, you're just going as that full suite. It can be done. Um, it largely depends on, on the data that you're going against, but there's potentially better options, uh, which is to do the step up that I referred to. Uh, so again, you, you perform your full text. You don't do the index. You get your results of a million objects. You perform some metadata filters. You get that down to 100,000 objects. Then you run your full text step up then your full text uh, indexes are only going to be on those 100,000 objects, so you'll get better response, better performance of any continued filters that you apply against those, you know, 100,000 objects or less. But again, even at that point, you're still, even when you have reduced it down to 1,000 objects, you're still running a full text search against the indexes of the 100,000 objects when you did the full text indexing. Okay. Um, so as part of that, again, we were trying to work on what the definition of a heat map would be and coming up with a potential report out approach. Um, so the goal would be to produce a report of our counts within each secondary level folder immediately below the highest functional level. level. So account of PI, personal information, account of uh, medical information. Um, we felt that if a piece of content was found to have more than one hit with personal information in it, or medical information, it would be counted once and only once. So if, in theory, it had a, an SSN and a passport number in it within the same piece of content, it would be counted once. Um, however, what we did decide, though, that if we had found both in there, so a piece of personal information and a piece of medical information, we would, in theory, count it once in both categories. Um, so then what we wanted to do from there was kind of take a 
a, a total count that may have potentially been out there, get a, a count of the PI within there potentially, an account of the MI, um, and then give a percentage of that uh, so that we could see kind of an overall percentage of what could potentially be out there. Um, the other things that we could do to kind of do a little more detailed metrics, metrics on it would be to use some other external tools um, as well as the CFB reports to do some more granular um, reporting at a, at a deeper level, including um, SQL Server. So uh, methodology, for, you know, from lessons learned perspective, you know, methodology, it, it's best to, you know, from, from our experience, we're kind of thrown into the deep end very quickly. Uh, and we, we can certainly recommend that if you're going to go through this process, start something and kind of see it all the way through. Um, that will help prevent uh, the mistakes that you uh, might find and, and having to recover. You know, we, we went multiple tracks concurrently, and we ended up having to redo some things. Um, harvesting. Uh, the Story Cube product did not do well with some special characters. Um, they, they are looking at creating some patches uh, for it, uh, but that was a concern, whereas, you know, Exchange allows you to use uh, special characters when, when the public folder names, and if you tried to create a volume at that level, it would create an error. Uh, so we had to work around that in various ways by harvesting at different levels. Uh, also in harvesting, harvest smaller sets uh, to increase your filtering performance. You know, we could have, in theory, harvested the entire, you know, Outlook public folder site and put it into a single info set, but it wouldn't have been productive and effective. You know, you need to, to understand your use case, understand your data, and you know, harvest at the appropriate level that makes sense for what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, filtering. Uh, refine the filters after we viewed them, you know, so, so the, the, the tool allows you to, before you even commit and create the filter, allows you to view the results of the filter or some, or some examples. Uh, Use that to your advantage. Even after you create a filter, you know, look at the results, go through the results a little bit yourself so that you can understand that you, what you really captured and do you need to tweak your filter to, to get the right result set. Uh, keyword searches perform better uh, when you're using you know, very specific words, uh, not a lot of wild cards and things like that. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, regular expressions uh, with a number uh, uh, proximity within keywords proved challenging. It's a, we got a lot of hits with our, our full text searching and it caused us some pain here and there. Uh, so again, you know, knowing when to do that full text indexing is, is really good. Uh, and lastly, uh, reporting. Um, this is just kind of a, a, a didn't know what you didn't know, getting back to our opening slide. You know, you can only run reports on user level info sets. So we actually had to, in order to create the, some of the CSV extracts that we used to uh, do reporting on, we actually had to uh, create some uh, user info sets that were the exact same set, you know, of two million objects just to, to run some processes on it. Uh, accomplishments. Uh, Store IQ was definitely very capable of producing uh, the heat map that we were looking for uh, to meet our audit item. Um, it, it definitely is proved that it was a, a value-added tool for unstructured data analysis. Um, couldn't have done this without the tool, you know. Um, it would have been insurmountable. Um, we, you know, looking back at it, we definitely exceeded the anticipated uh, business value for what we didn't know initially. You know, we, we were able to identify some things that we didn't even know we'd be able to identify. It, it was incredible. Uh, and uh, we established a strong foundation for future initiatives within the organization using this tool. Um, so that was great. Uh, our next steps, uh, we're going to begin utilizing the tool for some unstructured data cleanup, you know, eliminating our information chaos. Uh, we're going to evaluate the stored IQ for legal platform uh, for ongoing holds management. And uh, we're going to evaluate box integration with stored IQ to see how we can leverage that because we currently have box as well. And that pretty much wraps everything up. Uh, Scott, so I guess it's uh, back to you. Any questions uh, from the group? You are awesome. The, uh, we flew through that in 15 minutes, and uh, a lot of value, a lot of good stuff there. And I'm assuming we're going to have some good questions uh, from the audience, and we encourage your questions. I'm uh, clicking on some buttons here to get there so I can see them. And uh, if you could please post questions uh, in that panel. I think it, well, it's on the right for me. I think you can 
move it around, but type in questions there. And um, earlier, you, uh, I'll, I'll start you off here with a question here. You mentioned that you could only do the searches on the user info set. What, what's the opposite or the, the kind of a user set of the set that was not a user info set that you couldn't do the search on? So, uh, a little bit? Yep, yep. So uh, when, when you first create an info set, uh, when you first perform your harvest, you, have, you, you get a, a system info set. And that's, that's the highest level. Uh, and so it does not allow you to perform any actions for that matter. So you can't perform, uh, and this has been my experience, like, you know, there, there could be changes in the tool or, or I may not have all the experience in the world. So if others know otherwise, by all means, share. Uh, but my experience has been that you could not, not perform any actions on a system level info set. So if you wanted to perform data cleanup or, or reporting on what you were harvesting, you'd have to create a secondary user info set within the uh, app stack to perform those actions on. Yep, okay. And um, what, you, you did the heat map, uh, did you take actions on any of the content and, and how did you uh, find that experience if yes? Um, we did not take any actions at that point in time. The objective was to produce a potential heat map um, for the for the uh, policy that we were trying to achieve. Um, but our goal will be hopefully in the future to use that information to start our next steps, which would be to really do a unstructured data cleanup, not just within uh, Outlook public folders, but hopefully utilize obviously the same tool capabilities to look at land shares as, as well as potentially um, SharePoint. So the goal would be to do those as our next step. Great. Hey, we're getting some good questions coming in here. I'm going to choose the order here. I'm going to choose one of the recent ones here, though. What was the size of the data set? Can you, are you able to share? Yeah, uh, so uh, I think in the end we ended up, uh, I don't remember the total object count, uh, but I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood of, I, yeah, it was, I know it was, I know it was uh, 6.75 terabytes of data, that much I know, uh, and I know that, uh, I, was, around 15? yeah, I think, no, I think it was probably close to 20 million, yeah, it was like, it was like 20 million objects, Scott, and that, that includes, you know, when, when we were harvesting, we were harvesting the uh, parent objects as well as the contained objects. So in simple terms, that is saying we are harvesting the actual uh, posting or email as well as any attachments that were on it. So we had a, a far higher number of attachments and things. I think we ended up averaging somewhere close to uh, four attachments per object. Wow. Um, uh, what other products did you guys look at or consider? Or were you in the evaluation of products or was it, was it handed to you? Um, so, you know, we're, we're, from a content management standpoint, we are a file net shop, uh, and so therefore the close ties with uh, Stored IQ and IBM, uh, we felt that that was a good product to, to first review, and uh, we did a POC with IBM. Uh, they came on site, showed us how it worked, gave us some examples on our data. Um, it was a very good session, uh, good event overall, and we felt that Based on what we learned, it was there was nothing to say that we shouldn't use that product, and therefore, with its close ties to our existing FileNet infrastructure, we thought we'd, we'd select that product. Yeah, and yeah. one thing that we did during that POC is we actually seeded potential information into the environments that we were harvesting so that we could prove out that we were finding them. And we put a lot of different scenarios out there that we achieved searching for. That's pretty good. So you, you planted your own Easter eggs and found them, huh? Yep, and that's, you know, the, it's kind of the proof is in the pudding. So once you can prove those things and actually show that, that is, that is a very compelling truth. I like that. A um, uh, couple technical questions here. The special character limitations, uh, any suggestions? What, what did you do for workarounds, or can you speak more to that? Uh, so one of the things that we did for, for a workaround is we, um, we actually had some of our top level folders had special characters in them. And so the workaround there was to actually go down one level because thankfully there was not a lot of objects 
objects within the parent folder that was basically just a parent container with a lot of subfolders. So we could just go down that one level. Um, for some of the other ones, um, it, it, we had to bypass them into a certain degree. Um, but uh, IBM has uh, produced a patch that I believe will be coming up in a, in a future release based on uh, our PMR as well as other PMRs that were opened. Um, so it looks like it will not be an ongoing issue for a long time. All right, cool. Um, how many you used six data servers? And I know, uh, you know, in our experience, right, you were already kind of up and running and installing it and doing some harvesting. And then uh, Jason from Integral came in and helped. But you ended up with six. How did you determine six data servers? Um, it's what felt good, for lack of a better term. You know, the, 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 the bottom line comes down to is, is, is that from a harvesting perspective, uh, it comes down to you, you, you can only run so many threads on the data stack. Uh, so therefore, it's probably not best, and I'm being very general here, every environment is different. So, you know, it depends on if you're doing uh, full text indexing at the time of harvest, which we were, or if you're not. Uh, so, so our experience was that we didn't want to go out and execute probably more than three harvests concurrently on any one data server at a time. And given the amount of uh, data that we had to go against, we felt that uh, managing that across the six servers was best. You know, uh, we have a, you know, SortIQ is licensed by the number of terabytes that you go against. And clearly, at seven terabytes, we didn't come anywhere near our, our license goal, but we distributed that across those six servers. And so I think that overall helped the, the situation. Um, and there is no additional licensing per data server. So it's, it all comes down to how much it costs you to uh, spin up the appliance, basically. Right. Right. Good. Um, uh, Rob has a good question here. Can, can you elaborate? You, you mentioned that there were some, uh, you exceeded some of your initial expect, expectations. Uh, do you have any examples of value that you got you didn't anticipate getting maybe? Well, again, I, I think a lot of it, it came down to we did not have the luxury of time on our side. Um, so we really just, just kind of jumped into it to get, to get moving. Um, and, and being able to get in and, and produce filtering results that were at a level where we could actually look and see information, I think it actually helped us to uncover some of the other potential um, personal information or other types of filters that we wanted to do out there. Like passports, let's say, would probably not have been something would have, that would have been on our initial um, plan, but again, through through the, the, the moving forward and being able to evaluate as you go and kind of check and adjust, it allowed us to see a lot more information than we probably had any idea what we would expect. Not to mention the fact, too, that as we kind of went through a lot of that information and got into a little more detail, we were able to easily evaluate that, in some cases, potentially whole folders could be relevant information that by just getting into that next level of detail and using the tool to see that, it gave us that capability to know, all right, we don't need to spend a lot of time here potentially because we already can see right away that, that there is information that could be there. Right, right, cool. Um, the um, box, you're using box already some, and what are your plans or do you have plans yet with Box and integrating it with Stored IQ? Would you be moving records, collaborative content? What would you put in Box if you can share again? So, so we have a, a high population of Box users. I guess high is relevant depending on your your, your scale, uh, but uh, we're we're heavily using Box with our our, our field associates, and uh, the the definite plan is to make that connection with Stored IQ to Box uh, to do some harvesting and reviewing of what's out there to ensure that it's being used within the fashion in which it was intended to be used. Um, there is some additional thoughts of the potential releases of Stored IQ for legal and being able to put holds in place in Box uh, as a strong uh, business use case that we might want to look at. 
Uh, at this point, we have not made any connections to, to Box. Uh, we're still at the 7605 version. Um, so we're, we're kind of waiting right now and seeing where that goes and seeing what we can get funding for. Okay. Um, uh, William uh, Yee, hi, hi, William, asked a question. How did you utilize your, your um, services provider, Integro, for the Sword IQ initiative? And are you going to be self-sufficient going forward, or do you have plans to continue to utilize their services? Um, so basically it comes down to we had very little experience with the tool uh, day one. And that's where we felt that with the, the timeline that we had before us, while we could have tried to do it on our own, it just didn't seem like the right thing. And so that's where we opened up the door with Integro, had conversations, got an engagement, and uh, worked with some of their resources, uh, Jason in particular, and, and had a, a very good time of, of going down this path of this is how you get from A to B. Um, I think that we will have continued uh, relationships and discussions with Integro because I think just with, with their experience with this tool, uh, they have a lot more that they can do with us to uh, help us make sure we have the right foot going forward. Uh, but to that point, I think we also gained a, a big sense of uh, self-information and I think that we can stand on our own to a certain degree uh, for various efforts. It comes down to, I think when we look at new big efforts is when we're going to you know, utilize that, that relationship. Yeah, I was going to say I, I think that um, Integro and Jason really helped us kind of organize our thoughts as to how do we approach this from a heat map pers perspective um, to kind of give us a logical path to move forward and almost to move forward in an iter iterative step and process so that we could keep going. Um, I think that an approach like that will also be very beneficial when it comes time for um, unstructured information cleanup um, to kind of give us that best practices of how to attack it so that we can, can actually show, again, results quickly and efficiently. Um, I think it's easy for folks to say, well, we're going to do data cleanup and we're going to classify everything, but what does classify mean and what is everything? And, and I think that's where it helps to have experts to bring in to kind of help you organize your thoughts around those. Right. Um, well, that, that turned out to be a great segue. There's another question here. Um, Jerry was asking, um, in the proof of concept or, or otherwise, can someone describe technically how selected unstructured content would be archived and then later retrieved? Now, that wasn't, I don't think that's been part of your your activities yet. That might be more of a futures. Is that, can one of you take that or editorialize? As you can? So, so that's definitely a, a future act that we've not done yet, uh, but the tool definitely supports uh, the creating of uh, means of moving the content from one location to another. Uh, it can be ingested directly into P8 or it can be put into another location to be picked up another way or just moved from one repository to another, you know, and um, it definitely supports that. So uh, when we get there, you know, did, we're again probably going to be reaching out, out to Integro to get some experience. Did you test that out yet or, or um, just see it, see the button? Uh, I, I did some very minimal things in our, uh, our, our test environment to make sure that I saw that it could work, you know, um, but I couldn't speak to how well I think it's going to perform or, or, or what kind of throughput it would have or anything like that. Okay. Um, uh, Logesh uh, wants to know what version of StoreDeck Q are you guys using? Uh, we're currently on 7.6.05. All oh, right, you mentioned that. I knew that. Um, <laughs> hey, what a great dialogue here. Um, uh, I, I don't have any more questions in at the moment, so if folks want to add some more, we'll uh, uh, field them because we've got a – well, no, we're actually at one thirty. So being punctual, uh, any closing comments, uh, Clark or Jen, that you'd like to share? Um, it, it, it was definitely a learning experience. Uh, working with Integra was a great experience. And uh, I hope that everyone in the uh, group that participated today got some sort of value out of uh, what we presented. Great. Well, thank you. And, and uh, we appreciate your sharing. And, and for those folks on the phone, please email Kristen or, or just publish right out to the LinkedIn user group 
and tell about what you'd like to speak about your experience with Stored IQ, um, because I, there's a there's a lot of interest. People want to hear more about this, and so uh, please post what you'd like to share, and uh, we'll well we just may put you on the calendar. So thanks everybody for joining us. Please go sign up for the user group if you haven't already done so. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.